Um, as Ed uh, said, um, a lot of buildings in Winchester have been demolished, but we also have a lot of buildings, you know, that are still remaining. Um, really where you start to see the demolitions come into play in Winchester is about 1920. That's where you start seeing the demolitions not just to replace like a single house for a single house, but you start seeing uh, either like subdivisions, parking lots, or taking down an old house to put in brand new construction. So I've kind of organized this in three sections. Uh, one large house demolished for subdivisions, uh, a house demolished for uh, modern construction, and then obviously the worst is a house demolished for a parking lot. So um, let's get started. Uh, this is view of Winchester about 1900. Uh, do you guys recognize where this is in Winchester? Yep, this is um, where the Handy Mart is. And uh, that building's obviously gone. The building opposite it is a parking lot now. Uh, that house actually was not intentionally demolished. It blew up in a gas explosion. <laughs> um, and then up here in this corner, uh, that house. Does anybody recognize that house? That tower? Yes. That is uh, Anne Girona, the poor house of Winchester and later uh, female academies. This picture was taken, uh, as you can see, from the Winchester Inn. And that building looked like this. So uh, this building was originally, if you can believe it, this was also a replacement of an older building that was here. This was originally Aspen Hill. Um, this is where Bushrod Taylor uh, of the Taylor Hotel used to live. And in about 1890, 1891, uh, Judge Hanley was convinced that a, um, basically a resort hotel in Winchester would be uh, more advantageous to Winchester's economy than his idea to have a park. Unfortunately, his idea to have a hotel really was not um, the prosperous economic idea that he thought it was going to be. And the hotel remained empty until 1900. It was empty for 10 years. They got uh, someone to take over the hotel, and uh, the lessee abandoned it in just a couple months. And uh, after that, it was used for a school for a little while. But this building, as you can see, was then demolished in 1919. And that's what's here now. Um, as you can see, this is basically the subdivision on uh, Lee Street and up farther on the hill where the hospital is. And there were actually houses where this parking lot was as well. <laughs> Old hospital. Old hospital, yep. All right. 307 South Washington Street. Um, if you were one of the few people who were able to go to the Holiday House tour last year, uh, you might have heard about Judge Parker. He owned a good deal of land on Washington Street. And if you know where, um, how Thornhill sits on its lot, the next block up, uh, Judge Parker's house was also kind of in the middle of that entire block. So after he uh, passed away, his house was demolished to put in several more houses in that block. And uh, what was interesting about this house is that it was reportedly designed by uh, Thomas Jefferson. And uh, you might be wondering, well, okay, who's Judge Parker? He was the uh, judge at John Brown's trial. And as you can see today, approximately in the middle of two houses. And this one, this is the one we saw uh, the tower on, uh, the first slide. So this is Anne Girona. Uh, this was the poorhouse originally. And um, it operated as several different female academies in Winchester from about 1830s to the early 1900s. Um, you can see, let me see if I can point. Yes, 
Uh, you can see out front we have some of the ladies of the school uh, standing out here in this picture. Um, this one was a little bit of a different uh, situation. Uh, Anne Girona actually was in a fire uh, sometime in the late 1920s and then was later uh, demolished, uh, probably in the early 1930s. Here's what we have today. So basically all these houses uh, up here on this little extension of Piccadilly went in after Anne Girona was taken down. So that's still actually uh, the Angerona neighborhood watch. You can kind of find that name still. Now on the this next one, this is where we start getting into some of the more egregious demolitions. So this was uh, known as the Cannonball House on uh, South Loudon Street. It was um, owned by the Connor family. Uh, they bought it in 1851. And they were in residence during the Civil War. And on the night of August 18, 1862, a cannonball ca passed completely through the house. And just by luck, the family uh, was tending to the sick children in the upper stories of the house. And uh, the cannonball would have gone through the parents' bedroom, but because they were with the children, everyone was safe. And um, after that cannonball passed through the house, you can see they stuck the cannonball back in the house and then put up a sign to commemorate what happened. <laughs> um, and here is what they put in about 1959. Um, they, they put the cannonball back in the building. I mean, they, they were very proud of that. It's not the way it looks now. <laughs> yes, this, I think, was taken in the 1970s, this photo. So this one is um, the Greichen Glove Factory and the Hart Hotel. Uh, this is on North Cameron Street. Um, you might have seen this in some of the Out of the Past uh, articles that run in the Star. This one uh, gets a lot of play, I think, with uh, visitors. It'll say, like, so-and-so was staying at the hotel. And uh, as you can see, this one, you'll probably recognize this, the uh, modern apartments. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the uh, modern apartments on North Cameron Street, a little up from Reeder and Schwartz's office. And, of, of course, now we would look at that beautiful uh, factory building and think we could repurpose that for apartments now. But, yes, this was uh, the Empire Theater. This is how it originally looked when it was built. It had uh, lots of Art Nouveau um, decorative motifs on the exterior. Um, you may not be able to see it, but, uh, you know, the lettering on the uh, theater was, you know, very much that Art Nouveau uh, style. Uh, originally, uh, evidently this was a little too fancy for Winchester, and they took off all that decorative motifs uh, by the 1930s. And then they demolished it in the 1960s. For the bank, uh, BB and T Bank drive through. Sandra, mm -hmm. that decorative stuff was that was that like the things that are now on the coast building? It it looks like it was uh, stained glass of some sort. But that was that had come from another building. Oh, that hmm. That that is interesting. I I do not know. Something to check on. Now, this store is on South Loudon Street. Um, it has kind of an interesting history to it. Um, it was originally owned by uh, two uh, sisters. Um, evidently, the last remaining sister was named Elizabeth Pritchard. And when she died, she left this house to uh, Charles Henry and his wife, you know, as a thank you for taking care of her in her old age. 
And from about 1875 or so, uh, they operated, the Henrys operated this building as a fruit and veggie stand. You can see right over here is where they, um, you know, had their bins for their fruit and veggies. And evidently the Henrys became quite prosperous doing this. And um, when Henry passed away in 1948, he attempted to leave his estate to uh, the John Kerr School. And his heirs fought this and um, actually had his will deemed invalid so that they could keep their inheritance. And sometime after it left Henry's control, they put in the insurance building. That was, it says 52. So probably about the time they got the will settled and down with the house. Yeah, you guys recognize this one. This one makes the rounds on Facebook quite a lot. Uh, this is the uh, Barton home. It was also on South Washington Street. Um, so, you know, Lewis Barton, uh, historian of Winchester, this was his family home. It's also one of the few Second Empire style buildings that was in Winchester. So this is like the Gavis house. This one's more of the square form than his version with the wings. And um, it was demolished for the church. So uh, I, I don't have the church in here also, but there, there was the Braddock Street Church used to face on Braddock Street. And um, as you can see in the 1960s, they tore down the old church rebuilt here, which also took out the Barton house, and just, I think, I think it was just those two buildings that the church took down, but it, that was quite a loss on that corner. Of course, that's probably a contributing structure now. And this one, this after picture is almost more interesting for all the changes to the downtown instead of the building. Um, the building we're talking about is right here. This was um, apparently the second uh, Masonic Lodge in Winchester. Um, this was in use during the time of the Civil War. So if you might have seen in some of the histories about McKinley becoming a Mason in Winchester, this is the building that uh, was in use. So this is where he was made a Mason. And as you can see, it's already starting to be demolished in this picture, and in the after, uh, it was a bank, I think it was in drive through originally, and now I think it's an ATM. Here's another one with a uh, Civil War connection. This is the Kent Street Presbyterian Church. You guys recognize where this is? Yep, where the star is. Uh, this building was built about 1838 to 1839. Uh, the Presbyterian Church had had a falling out. The congregation split. Um, half left uh, the church and started their own on Kent Street. And uh, they were here until about 1900 when it was converted to a steam laundry. And then there was a garage in here. And then in 1937... It was torn down and star building. <coughs> that one, that one's not. It, it's more, it's more sad for the loss of the history in that building because, uh, again, if you've done your Civil War research, this is uh, that was a church where Stonewall Jackson worshipped during his time in Winchester. All right, you guys, recognize this one. This is. Um, called the Piccadilly Apartments, you can kind of see. I think on that uh, handout map we have, uh, there's uh, Mrs. Hopkins lived here in the 1870s, if you find it, and then um, right before it was torn down, it was Mrs. Frank Buckley, um, who apparently owned it. I don't have any other information on that, but here's another building that could have easily been adapted for what went in next. Ooh. 
that that one yeah social security building um, it's right across from uh, the colonial arts and crafts building so that that I think was more of a loss for that street just to have that block of a building right across the front Okay, Betty Dandridge, who remembers, who knows what that name means? Yes, uh, she was his daughter. Um, evidently, her mother was a semi-invalid, um, and during the time uh, that Zachary Taylor was in the White House, she was the hostess for the White House. And I have a little quote of, you know, basically what a wonderful hostess she was. Uh, she became widely acquainted with noted men and women during her brief but brilliant regime in the White House, and she was known far and wide as a young woman of rare fascination and beautiful character. It was regarded as a high honor to be asked to one of her entertainments. So, of course we can't keep that house. Uh, this is where Winchester Printers was. Um, it may have... I have one note that said it may have been a parking lot initially, but the Winchester Printers building must have gone in very soon after uh, the house was demolished. Now this one, I don't think you will have seen this photo before. Um, this was one that PHW used back in about 1963 when we were getting started as an example of, this was a bad idea to tear this house down. Uh, this was the Hollis House. Um, it was on the corner of Cork and Kent Street, so where the Sheets is now. Um, this house was built about 1830, and Charles Hollis uh, was a tanner, and he possibly operated at least one, maybe both, of the tan yards that were on that corner of Kent Street. And... I had to use the old photo. <laughs> so that, that was actually what that looked like before the sheets uh, got in there. And that was, I believe it was an Atlantic. Bose Belly Barn. Bose Belly Barn, yeah. Which is much more. <laughs> and this is, right, who was here for uh, Tim's lecture last time and remembered that, yeah, I, I think I, I was recording, so I didn't see, but I think most people said what went in this lot was non-contributing. This is probably why you thought it was non-contributing, because of the Chanticleer Inn. Uh, this was built uh, about the 1850s, but uh, usually it's referred to, um, if it's not the Chanticleer Inn, it's the Denny House. So who was Denny? Uh, he was the man who had it after the original owner. And according to Russell, he improved it. So that kind of code for improving means adding, it's a little hard to see, but you see these are uh, you know, flat top windows with some molding over the top. So most likely when he improved it, he added uh, those kind of decorative motifs to the building. Um, Denny, unfortunately, I hope I, I'd hope there was going to be a good quote, but uh, he was a character in Mark Twain's book, Innocence Abroad. Uh, Denny was apparently part of this expedition that Mark took, uh, Mark Twain took. And uh, he's mentioned, I think it's chapter 32, he finds some grapes. <laughs> unfortunately, that was all he did. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I was surprised. Uh, that book, which I had never heard of before I started researching this, was Mark Twain's bestseller during his lifetime, and it was the best-selling travel book of its era. Now, here's, here's where we really... Oh, let me show you what was there afterwards. So this is uh, the bank building that um, in Tim's uh, lecture last month. Uh, that is a contributing building now, but I, I'm sure everyone who said that's not contributing is because you were thinking of the Chanticleer and what was lost. I was very happy to find this little photo. 
Uh, obviously, it was from a newspaper, but this is another one that PHW used uh, back about 1963 when we were getting started. Um, this was, you know, just a little vernacular stone house, but it was used by Dr. Baldwin. Um, you may, uh, if you're familiar with Mary Baldwin College, he was, I believe, her father or her grandfather. Um, that was that connection. But uh, Dr. Baldwin was also the physician to Lord Fairfax. And a couple stories claim that Lord Fairfax may have died in this building, and uh, somehow Dr. Baldwin came to be in possession of his boots, and the boots were apparently in this building for quite a while. Kind of a strange story. But um, this building, I had to use an old photo for this one too, because this is shocking. Here's your first parking lot. Uh, this was for the Kern Motor Company. Um, originally, this was part of, I guess, their sale lot for their cars. And um, now there are modern apartments in here. They're townhouses. Yeah. So. This is another building I was happy to find in that newspaper article from 1963. Uh, this is the Lore Capper House. So this is on North Loudon Street, and this was one of several houses in that block. Um, they were all uh, demolished for, I'll just show you. Originally, this was the Sears parking lot. Um, the uh, parking garage is on this spot now. So all of the houses that were in this block, um, you know, they were probably 1830s or earlier. Uh, one of the houses in that block was Rebecca Wright's house. Uh, you may know her name from the Civil War. She was a Quaker, who I believe, um, was it Sheridan that she was slipping notes to? Yeah. So her house was in that block. There's also a Rodman house and a Lillian Sheets house. Now this one is kind of interesting. Uh, this is right down the street from us, uh, probably as you pass the uh, Star Building over here. Uh, you pass by that block. Um, these were probably post-1870, so these are some of the newer houses, but on the Sanborn maps, they're listed as the Faulkner block, and from what I can find out, the Faulkners uh, apparently were merchants for lady shoes, and apparently they, you know, clustered in this one area, and it's unusual to see in the Sanborn map that um, just a residential block would have a name like that. It's very unusual, so I'm, I'm wondering the story on that. Um, obviously, we're in the parking lot section now, so here we are. <laughs> Some of you are probably parked right there. <laughs> and this one. Uh, this is kind of a twofer. Uh, we're mainly looking at the church, which is uh, St. Stephen's Church. Uh, this was a black church. Um, but also we have a little laundry building, kind of the corner of it right here. Um, so the church, uh, they, they were here sometime prior to 1870. They do appear on that uh, map handout. But uh, in 1928, they purchased their own land and moved out. And uh, it was... This building was actually demolished prior to the 1947 Sanborn, so it was it was gone a little earlier than that 1950s date. Uh, the laundry managed to stay a little longer, but um, you'll probably recognize this lot. This is the uh, First Presbyterian's uh, church lot now. Um, this one. Uh, if you've seen some previous iterations of this slideshow, you may have seen this listed as the W.B. Snyder House. Um, I did a little more research and found out the original owner was William Baker. Uh, Snyder 
uh, evidently was a later occupant. Uh, you probably remember it better as the American Legion building. Um, it actually has its sign out in this photo right there. And this was, I think, one of the first ones on North Cameron Street that was taken down for parking lots. And guess what? It's still a parking lot. I don't have a lot of information on this one. But uh, as you can see, this is on North Braddock Street. So orient yourself. Basically, where I'm standing is the corner of um, Braddock and uh, Boscowan Street. Over here, right here, we have the little corner of a filling station, and then boop, boop, two houses. The one we're actually looking at is the Stone House. Uh, this was owned by the Piper family, and um, it was. You know what's coming. Parking lot. Well, this poor little house. I think PHW may have had a hand in accidentally demolishing this house sooner than it would normally have been demolished. Uh, we had marked this on our 1966 list of buildings and said that this one was worthy of preservation. And apparently, right after, we said, this house, we should save this house. It was demolished. Um, and it's still just a grassy lot. And this one, uh, you probably recognize what's in the background there. That's the uh, George Washington Hotel, just a little bit farther down the road from us. Um, and uh, this was the home of Mary Greenhow Lee. Uh, she was a Civil War diarist, um, so basically this was the house she was living in as she was recording her diary, and, uh, you know, we have to have more parking spaces. I mean, what is that, like 12 spaces? Got to have it. Now, the old police station, though, Yes. where was that in? The next parking lot up, I guess. That driveway went yeah. down the north side of the police station. Gotcha. Where's boxwoods in that previous photo? I feel like some old boxwoods. I don't see any. I know Stuart Bell had written that there were boxwoods over here. I don't. I don't see them in this picture. But I, I think it may just be a stone wall. Yeah, and you knew, you knew I had to end with this one. <laughs> so uh, this is the Conrad House. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back for uh, preservation in Winchester. Um, after losing all of those previous buildings, um, this was the one that had the most history. It was one of the oldest. Um, you may be able to see on your handout, there was uh, kind of a northern wing to the back that looked very similar to Dr. Baldwin's office. So that was the oldest portion of that house, about 1750. Uh, the front of the house, um, you know, in the exterior and interior uh, were apparently allegedly brought over uh, plans from Scotland where uh, Daniel Conrad was studying to be a doctor. Um, the Conrad family had basically owned it, you know, from the 1750s up until about 1953, I think, uh, maybe a little earlier, maybe 19, 1920s. And then the McCormicks operated it as apartment buildings for a while after that. Um, it was sold to uh, the city of Winchester, and it was pretty obvious it was going to be parking lot. That was the general progression of things. When the city was acquiring property, uh, it was going to be a parking lot. So uh, PHW, before we were PHW, uh, also garden clubs, the historical society, uh, individual citizens in Winchester all protested this, and there were really two parts of this. 
Uh, the first was in that 1963-1964 era when it was controlled by the city. And we managed to basically get that to a tie vote and prevent the funding for it. Uh, right after that, the city turned it over to the Winchester Parking Authority. Um, it had about five-year grace period or so before it was once again up for demolition. Uh, we were not able to uh, stop the demolition. I wish I had the picture when it was parking lot straight across. But basically, um, this is your judicial center now. But at one point, it was parking straight across. And you could stand on the front steps of Rouse City Hall and see all the way over, basically, to the cemetery. You could see uh, past the Star Building and up onto the hill. Um, even though uh, we did lose this building, um, it was, I think, such a contentious and long and drawn out and public fight that it really cemented PHW and preservation as a fixture in Winchester. Um, this is kind of the start of uh, where we were uh, trying to get the National Register nomination, the first one in the 1970s, uh, the beginnings of the BAR, um, and also really the start of our revolving fund, as uh, Pat mentioned, we started buying these kinds of endangered properties because we were told uh, by city council when we tried to save the Conrad House, if you don't buy them, you might as well face it, they're going to be lost. So we had to get hands in, save some buildings, and show that it could be done and it was worthwhile. Um, I have a few others. Now these are post-Conrad House, but I think they're worth mentioning just, you know, as kind of oddities, uh, you know, kind of lost buildings. So this one is also on North Cameron Street. Uh, the Scott Affleck House. Um, Scott Affleck was a farm implements dealer, and uh, he had this building designed, uh, or built basically from designs by George F. Barber, who was a mail order architect. This was prior to uh, Sears and Montgomery Wards and Aladdin Homes. Um, he would not give you the kit, he would just give you the specifications, and uh, you would have to build it locally. Um, I am not sure that we knew when this house went down. This was basically right before BAR uh, went into effect and demolitions would have to uh, be approved. Um, that, you know, that it was designed by an actual architect and it, you know, had this history to it. Um, this is probably another one that was trying to slip in before regulations went into place. Um, it was uh, basically a drive-through that connected where the uh, Masonic Lodge uh, photo was on the mall, where that ATM is now. Kind of. Apple Blossom. Apple Blossom headquarters. Yep. And this one, this is obviously outside the district, but. Um, this was the Keckley Mill, and obviously as a mill, uh, you're thinking, well, how old can it be? Most of the mills in Winchester were burned during the Civil War. Uh, this one actually survived because it was Quaker-owned. Uh, if you were a Quaker, you basically were able to say, I'm a Quaker, don't tear down my building, I'm not supporting slavery. Um, and this building was pretty much intact. It supposedly had the water wheels, all of the um, original machinery in the building, but um, it was deemed unsafe. Uh, it had asbestos in it. So what do you do when it has asbestos? Just tear it down. Um, this was demolished, yeah, about 1995. So it's, it's very striking to me, as you look at the interior photos of this building, it is almost identical on the interior to the Kurtz building that we were working on about the same time. And um, I, I think the Kurtz building was probably in worse structural shape than this building. But, you know, it was a large building. It was outside of a historic district. There were no... Uh, you know, controls against demolition. 
this was the Hardee's. This was apparently Hardee's signature uh, building style in the 19, 1950s, 1960s, I guess. Uh, ours in Winchester was built in 1967, I believe. And um, uh, if, if it was in color, you'd be able to see it was a very vibrant orange and uh, uh, stood out, obviously. Um, does anybody know the uh, architectural style of this? It has, no, it, ha it has a great name. It, Ray, yeah, Ray Gun Gothic. What? Ray Gun Gothic. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it, it was basically um, inspired by the uh, car culture and that kind of fascination with space and kind of futuristic stuff. So some, you'll see it referred to a lot of times as a tomorrow that never was. <laughs> so by uh, the 1970s, this was already out of fashion. Like this, this was too over the top. It was too flashy. It was too campy. Um, a lot of them have been, uh, if they're still existing, they've been toned down. Get rid of all that brightly colored panels and whoa. Um, but in Winchester, we actually had some idea that this was actually an important building. And uh, PHW did try to find a buyer to uh, save that building, you know, basically dismantle it and take it somewhere else. Uh, it didn't happen, unfortunately. So we have a parking lot now. But um, that, that, was, that was interesting. That, that surprised me because that, that was definitely a one-of-a-kind sort of building in Winchester. And that in the 1980s, we already had a sense in Winchester that that was something worth preserving. It was pretty amazing. So that is pretty much the main part of my slideshow. I have to plug uh, the Stuart Bell archives. A lot of the photos uh, came from their collection. Um, also, we had some from E.E. E. Bayless, Ben Ritter, and of course our collection. And if you enjoyed the slideshow, please consider donating uh, your historic photos to the Stuart Bell Archives. It's a great resource for Winchester.